Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, if you're watching this live or recorded. I'm John Levine of Levine Electronics and Electric. Today's speaker is our own Michael McClellan. Levine Electronics and Electric is a manufacturer's rep organization that covers Georgia, Alabama, Florida, Tennessee, Mississippi, and Arkansas. We have two divisions, a control division and a power division. Please check out our website at l-3.com. Our philosophy is to get back to the industry to make it safer and better for all. We have three team members that are actually officers of IEEE and three members that are on the IEEE Pulp and Paper Subcommittee. Michael McClellan, our marketing director, has been running these webinars almost every day to help our customers during this corona time. You will find recordings of all the ones we've done in the past on our resources page of our website. We are known as the transformer experts in our territory, which you will see from Michael's presentation. We have an entire section on our resource pages with over 35 white papers just on transformers, talking about K-Factor and other things, zigzag. It's an excellent resource for you to check out. If you have any questions, this will be how we'll do this presentation. If you have any questions, you can type it in the question box and we'll answer those at the end. We also have four handouts that we can download Michael's um during the presentation so you can see those during the presentation we'll have some poll questions that we will be asking so stay tuned for those certificates for this should go out around five o'clock tomorrow without further ado michael i'll turn it over to you thank you john uh, like john said i'm michael mcclellan i'm a partner here at l3 living electronics and electrics and what we're going to try to do here today is go over uh, three-phase distribution liquid-filled transformers and try to cover all the different things that can be specified as far as the windings, the core, the losses, the accessories, the gauges, and lots of other um, nuances. So we're going to cover at a minimum how to arrive at the KVA the voltages and the bushings that you're going to use um, in the in, when manufacturing the transformer. We're gonna have a discussion about which decisions should I make and which decisions should I leave up to the transformer manufacturer. And we'll have a short uh, discussion at the end of some of the current events that are currently going on in the world uh, that are going to affect transformers availability and pricing uh, here in the very near future. In order to keep the presentation to an hour, there's a, a lot of material to cover and we are not going to cover power, class one power transformers or uh, any transformer that has a load tap changer or uh, any type of dry type transformer. Okay, so this is just kind of a test to see if everyone can figure out how to use the pole. So we're going to ask a question. I'll leave this up for about 30 or 45 seconds so we can kind of get used to using these polls. <clears throat> and the poll should flash up on your screen very shortly. Okay, excellent. We've got plenty of people who answered. And if you answered uh, D, that transformers do not know the words, you would be correct. So. And if, you, if anyone answered A, because mercury is in retrograde, um, please please contact us and we'll refer you to a, um, a qualified psychologist. So one of the things that people ask is, what is the absolute minimum information that we can receive in order to quote a transformer? And in reality, we can provide a price given only three pieces of information. If you can give us a KVA rating and the primary and secondary voltage, we can produce a budgetary proposal for you, but we are going to make lots and lots of assumptions. We're gonna go ahead and assume that it's a three-phase pad-mounted transformer, or depending on the application, if we know, we will assume it's a unit substation. We're going to assume that it's a delta primary and a Y secondary connection. 
we're going to specify aluminum windings on both the primary and secondary. We're going to assume 65 degrees C rise. We're going to assume that you don't want any fans on the transformer. We're going to assume that price is an issue, so we're going to quote this with mineral oil. We're going to quote dead front because I like to err, always err on the side of safety, and there's really no adder for quoting a pad mounted transformer with dead front bushings. And I'm going to quote it as loop feed because it's a very, very small adder to get those extra three bushings. And then you have a place to put arresters, or if you ever find yourself needing to loop out of that transformer, you now have the capability to do so. This is a specification, this is a, a presentation for consulting engineers, maybe some end users, uh, anyone who wants further education on transformers, and it, it's to be used to build a specification for a client. Um, every Almost every slide in the presentation has a hyperlink uh, that goes to either a manufacturer website or um, some sort of engineering website where you can get more information regarding these topics. And so there are three types of distribution transformers. There are pad mounted transformers. Looks like the picture didn't make it into that uh, slide. Um, the interesting thing about pad mounted transformers is, and I can't quote the ANSI standard um, from memory right now, but pad mounted transformers must pass what we call an enclosure integrity test. So they must be tamper proof. So once you specify that the transformer is a pad mounted unit, uh, now you have forced a manufacturer to adhere to certain standards to make sure that transformer is tamper proof. So if it went onto a college campus or a uh, public area, uh, there will be, um, the, the possibility is very, very slim that someone could get into that transformer and um, be, be harmed by the voltage. So there's also a unit substation transformer and we define these transformers as, <coughs> um, a transformer that has uh, usually is close coupled uh, on both sides or one or more sides to a piece of switch gear and usually the bushings are enclosed so they are not exposed to uh, personnel and finally the open substation type unit uh, usually has cover mounted bushings it exists in a substation usually a utility substation and um, it has a it has to have a fence around it so <clears throat> there are two types of conductors that can be used in uh, tr any, any type of transformer. There is uh, copper, of course, and aluminum. And this is a good time for another poll question, which is really kind of a transformer uh, trivia. <clears throat> so let's see who who out there knows their transformers and um, understands a little bit about copper versus aluminum. Michael, do you want to answer a question while this is going on? Um, I'm taking a look at the questions um, and we, we will answer some of these at the end of the presentation for sure. We do have a question, can we get these templates at the end of the presentation? Uh, yes. and um, you will certainly get a copy of the presentation and also um, a Word document that is editable. All right, so I'm going to close the poll. And for those of you who have experience with transformers or are good test takers and see the word always in a true false question, uh, this one is false. Um, a, tr a transformer of almost any efficiency can be uh, manufactured with copper or aluminum windings. There are- Yeah, Michael, I, uh, this, this is Adam here. I'll, I'll interject and give a little bit of take here. Um, usually the, the biggest 
difference um, with aluminum and copper. I mean, obviously, price typically copper is more expensive. But uh, you know, if you if you have footprint concerns of where the transformer is going, copper is a safer bet because it will allow for a smaller footprint of that transformer versus aluminum. Obviously, aluminum takes more winding material to get to the same impassivity load output. So. That's always one thing to think about. If you have space constraints, copper is a safer bet. Absolutely. <clears throat> so there are a few different uh, types of windings, and by windings, I mean the shape of the windings. There are, of course, uh, rectangular windings uh, that can be built with either a wound or a stacked core. Uh, there are circular windings that are uh, very um, strong during a short circuit. Um, and then there's the oblong or ob round windings, which have characteristics of both. Um, the ob round winding uh, is mostly rectangular with the corners sort of cut off, if you will. And I'll show some pictures of that. But here to the right, you'll see a, a photo of a gentleman at a transformer manufacturer who is winding a, um, a rectangular uh, coil. And you can tell by the rectangular uh, mandrel and that um, that transformer <clears throat> is obviously uh, yeah, gonna go on to a rectangular core. So um, here is a circular winding. Let's see if I can, if this video will work. So hopefully everybody could see that video. <clears throat> and uh, obviously it's of a gentleman winding a circular type uh, winding. And this transformer is probably, uh, judging by the size of it, maybe a 12, 15, could be, you know, 18, 20 MVA transformer. And uh, certainly circular windings are superior. Uh, in fact, they're uh, used exclusively um, when you get into power transformers, you know, things, transformers above 10 or 12 MVA. Here's a nice picture of a ob round winding. And as you can see, it, it has uh, some of the properties of a rectangular and some of a circular. It is easier to manufacture because uh, the core steel, uh, much of it can be cut to the same length, but <clears throat> you have some advantages uh, with regards to the short circuit strength. Uh, during a short circuit, every <clears throat> every man, every transformer tries to go round, okay? And uh, transformers that fail during a short circuit always fail at the corners. Uh, so that is why um, many customers prefer ob round or circular windings. There are different types of core steel used in the transformer construction process. <clears throat> they are, uh, when, they're, when they're purchased by the transformer manufacturer, they are uh, rated um, by efficiency. So there's an M4, M5 core steel. I don't, I don't think any transformer manufacturers are still using M5. Uh, I believe with the DOE standards that came about in 2016, that everyone was forced to go to M4 or um, or a greater efficiency. There are core steels uh, rated with H's, uh, H1, H0. Uh, those core steels are more expensive. Uh, they are uh, thinner, so more laminations can be put on the same size core and more eddy currents can be reduced, thereby the heating is reduced and that will make a more efficient, less lossy core. Uh, in the past five or six years, <coughs> uh, amorphous core steel has gotten more and more pl uh, publicity. It is the highest efficiency of any of the silicon steels. Um, however, its manufacturing process is complex. It's, it's actually poured onto a, uh, a cooling wheel and made much much like glass and it so it's not very easy to produce although the manufacturing is getting better um, it is very difficult for transfer manufacturers to handle just because it is is a very fragile <clears throat> item 
Amorphous has gained a lot of traction in China. Um, they produce transformers with very, very low uh, core losses. Some of the accessories on that go on these transformers, uh, both uh, pad mounted and substation type. Uh, this is this is pretty much the bare minimum. This is um, a liquid level gauge uh, is, is part of the ANSI standard gauge package. So uh, chances are you're going to get one no matter who you order the transformer from or who you specify. Uh, in, and a liquid temperature gauge is also standard. And uh, many times a pressure vacuum gauge is depending on the size of the transformer. So here's uh, some examples of a liquid level gauge. And uh, the reason for this gauge should be obvious, but uh, for those of you new to transformers, obviously we wanna, we wanna make sure that the level of liquid in the transformer is always above the core and coil assembly to make sure it's getting sufficient cooling. Uh, if, the, if oil somehow leaks out of the transformer, um, very shortly, the transformer will build up too much heat and will fail due to uh, continued over temperature. So uh, it's a simple gauge. Most of them are just a float and uh, detects the oil level. Now these range, you know, all the way from $15 to, um, you know, a couple thousand. Um, they're as simple as a float gauge and they get up to uh, as complex as analog outputs, um, digital outputs, uh, switches to close and open contacts when the level gauge is uh, too low. Uh, so um, I, I've put a, quality, a link to Qualitrol's website in this slide and, and you could spend all day educating yourself on these gauges. This is what a pressure vacuum gauge looks like. Uh, of course, it indicates um, liquid filled transformers are sealed devices. They are not meant to exchange air with the uh, outside outside world. Um, so <clears throat> a pressure vacuum gauge is a very uh, helpful device for a maintenance person to check um, quarterly or annually. And you really want to look for um, any value other than zero. <laughs> um, a pressure vacuum gauge, is, the one shown in this picture, has the uh, best reading you can hope for, which is a positive pressure, uh, which means, A, that the transformer is still sealed. It hasn't lost uh, its uh, integrity. The tank has not been compromised. And also uh, that <clears throat> a positive pressure means it's not sucking in air from the uh, outside world, uh, which has moisture in it. So the best you can hope for is to come across a vacuum, a pressure vacuum gauge with, that shows a positive pressure. Um, your second choice is it, it shows a vacuum, which is acceptable because it means the tank is still intact. What you really don't want to run across is a uh, transformer whose pressure vacuum gauge constantly reads zero because that means most likely your tank has um, ruptured or the integrity has been compromised. And again, there's a link here to the um, uh, Qualtrics website. Uh, here are some liquid temperature gauges and these measure the temperature of the actual fluid. Um, there is also a uh, gauge that I did not mention here that we call a winding temperature gauge. That actually uh, is comes from um, RTDs uh, in the actual uh, windings. So here's another example of a liquid temperature gauge. And this one uh, happens to have <coughs> um, switches in it that will uh, close and open contacts based on where the needle is. So uh, this will go back to a PLC 
or to another device and let someone know remotely that, uh, hey, this transformer has uh, is overheating. Someone needs to come inspect it or figure out why it's overloaded, uh, et cetera. There are a couple types of uh, cooling, uh, natural convection cooling that transformers, uh, transformer manufacturers use. <clears throat> uh, one of them is what we call corrugate. It's you know corrugated steel, and it's a very cost-effective option because most of the manufacturers can do this in-house. Um, some of them have machines to do it automatically. Uh, some of them have uh, workers who can uh, put steel into a, uh, a press and um, that repeatedly uh, presses the metal and can, can uh, fabricate these uh, corrugated coolers. And once the <clears throat> transformer uh, exceeds a certain size, Corrugate just is not going to cut it. Uh, it it's just not going to um, provide effective enough cooling, and that's when transform manufacturers go to uh, radiators um, that are usually manufactured by a third party. Here's some pictures. Uh, pictures worth ten thousand words, and um, here's a. Um, Transformer I actually ran across the other day at a, at a water treatment plant, and this is a great example of corrugate. Um, and this is probably a smaller transformer. It might be 300, it might be 500 kVA, and um, a corrugate uh, does the job in this case. Here's another example of uh, corrugate, and <clears throat> what you're seeing in this picture is there are that those fins are hollow so that the oil can uh, move through those fins from, uh, it, it comes in the top, goes down it through the fin, and then will come back into the tank at the bottom of the fin, and, uh, and, and in the process, will, uh, the heat will evaporate out of that fluid and it will return to the tank uh, cool, and then the process starts all over again. This is Michael. Uh, I think one one good thing to add um, on this particular on this particular type of fin is this is um, the most common way for pad mounts. So if, if you're specifying a pad mount, typically it's going to come with this type of fins by default, just the way they're they're inherently designed. If you go to a unit substation, Michael's got some slides that are proceeding that, that show more than options for unit substation, but most 99% of the time, all pad mounts are gonna have that fin type design for the radiators. Um, Adam is absolutely correct. Um, although there are occasions where larger pad mounted units will require radiators. Um, the, the KVA is dependent on the manufacturer, uh, but um, it, it ultimately you're going to have to go to radiators at some point. So uh, I ran across this transformer uh, and at a different water treatment plant. It's an older ABB unit, and uh, this was a good design. Uh, ABB um, had the ability to uh, manufacture these. I, you know, we could call them stamped radiators. Uh, and they manufactured them in-house, so they were able to provide a, a um, cost-effective uh, method of cooling. Uh, a little better than corrugate, not as good as uh, what I would call the pancake-style radiators, but very effective. And here is uh, here are the radiators. Uh, they're made by several different manufacturers in the U.S. and abroad, and uh, I believe Trantec is still the market leader uh, on these. Uh, they're available in mild steel, stainless steel, galvanized, um, and of course the transform manufacturer has to order these from Trantec. Um, and I don't want to speak out of turn. I don't know. I, I just don't know of a transform manufacturer that manufactures their own radiators, but. 
Trantech is very, very good at this. They've been doing it a long time. They have all the certifications um, and it's a very, very good product and uh, very effective at cooling. In most small transformers, the radiators are just welded onto the tank. Um, I would prefer, if, if, I'm, if I'm a consulting engineer, if I'm going to put a transformer indoors, I am going to specify removable radiators. And here's why. In, in case the transformer fails and must be removed to be worked on, and let's assume it's something in the core and coils that have, have failed, uh, it's very difficult to move around a transformer that's liquid filled with the radiators attached. They're usually large units. They're 75, 85, could be 100 inches deep, and they will not go through a standard doorway. Uh, I, if it, were, if it were me, would always specify removable radiators <clears throat> if the transformer is going in a building. And you can see how these work. Um, there's a hole for a bolt, and then there's a ball valve. Uh, that's not a ball valve, it's another kind of valve. And here's kind of a close-up of what's going on. So if the radiator needed to be removed, you would simply close the valve and remove the radiator, and then you could um, move the transformer a lot easier. Um, I've seen consultants specify radiator uh, valves on one side, on the tank side, and also uh, sometimes on both sides. Obviously, the advantage to having them on both sides is you close both valves, remove the radiators, you don't spill any fluid. Um, if you only have the valves on the tank side, then uh, you, you save all the fluid in the tank, but you, the fluid uh, from the radiators obviously uh, discharges onto the ground and must be dealt with. So this is a question I get all the time. Um, why are there so many ratings of a, on a transformer? Why are there, why do I see two ratings? Why do I see four ratings or sometimes even more, more ratings? Okay. In the liquid filled transformer world, the standard, the ANSI standard is to manufacture a core and coil that will, uh, when it's uh, fully loaded, will <clears throat> rise 65 degrees above the ambient temperature. And that has worked for many, many, many years. There are some customers who, I believe, specify 50, 55 degrees C temperature rise. Uh, it gives them an extra, it, they specify it because I believe at one point, the standard was 55 degrees. A 55 degree C transformer is gonna give you about a 12% additional capacity. Now, what does is, what is that, that get you? If you order a 3000 kVA transformer, and it just is a plain Jane 65 degrees C rise transformer, it is going to rise 65 degrees above the ambient when you put 3000 kVA of load onto it. And this transformer will last 25, 30 years. There are folks though who are not comfortable with that, and who want even more capacity out of that transformer or have an ambient temperature that exceeds what the ANSI standard calls for. The ANSI standard is 40 degrees C continuous over a 24 hour period at a, and a 50 degrees C maximum. If you are in the desert or somewhere where that ambient temperature is higher, say it's continuously 50 degrees C or with a maximum of 60 degrees C, you would want to specify a 55 degrees C transformer. The other rating is the fan rating. And so you could have, at a distribution transformer, you could have up to four ratings, as I've shown here in this slide. You could have your base rating, which is 1500 kVA. And the nomenclature of this is the slashes separate the fan rating from the non-fan rating and the dashes separate the 
degree C rise ratings, okay? So if, if you have a 1500 kVA transformer and you have, you, you decide I'm gonna specify 55 to 65 degree C rise, I'm gonna specify, a, we call that a dual rating, you are gonna get a transformer that is base rated at 1500, but it's gonna run at 1500 kVA and it's going to rise 55 degrees C above ambient at 1500 kVA with no, without the fans on, okay? If you turn the fans on, now this transformer is capable of 1785 kVA, but still at a 55 degree C rating. Then the 1682 rating is the temperature with no fans, but we're allowing that same transformer to rise to 65 degrees C, which is, we've proved in the marketplace is perfectly acceptable. Not only is it, it is, not only is it acceptable, there are now transformer manufacturers going to 75 degrees C and higher. And of course your top end rating on that transformer is 2000 kVA. That's with the fans on, and allowing the temperature to rise 65 degrees C above ambient. And where is this beneficial? The greatest application I can think of is in a double-ended unit substation. In a double-ended unit sub, the transformers are usually both feeding the lineup and the tie is that the 480 volt tie breaker is open. If I'm a consultant and money is very, very important, I am gonna specify a transformer that can feed one side of the lineup at its 55 degrees C non-fan rating. And I'm going to give it a dual rating and put fans on it so that if a situation arises where the transformer on side B needs to be maintained, the transformer could operate the entire lineup with the tie closed at its fan rating and its 65 degree C rating. In a previous slide, we used some terms. Um, I'd like to more clearly define those. The ONAN class refers to a mineral oil filled transformer that does not have fans. An ONAF rating is the a, a transformer that uh, is filled with mineral oil and has fans. A KNAN transformer has a high is filled with a high fire point fluid and does not have fans. And a KNAF has a high fire point fluid and has fans. Here is a chart that sort of tells you what your KVA rating uh, is when you put fans on the transformer. Um, and you can see it, it's not constant um, among all KVAs. The percentage is not constant. And some of this is due to, as we discussed earlier, corrugate versus radiators uh, and that kind of thing. Um, so below 2000 KVA and below you get an extra 15% of the base KVA rating by adding the fan package. 2500 KVA and above, you get 25% of the base rating. And then at 12 MVA, <clears throat> you get 33%. Again, we, we defined uh, some of these <clears throat> terms earlier. The um, there's a 55 degree C transformer, there's a 65 degree C, and there's a dual rated 55, 65, and there's a 75 degree C rating. I'm asked uh, quite often, what is the difference between a 55 degree C transformer and a 55 slash 65 degree transformer? Um, there is no difference in the physical construction of the transformer. You're gonna pay slightly more for a 55 slash 65 because it will be tested at both ratings. And you will receive a nameplate 
that shows both KVAs. One of the things to cover when you're talking about transformers, you have to talk about the basic impulse level. Um, this is a test that is meant to simulate uh, lightning, uh, a lightning strike. It is defined as a 1.2 microsecond pulse at 100% of the BIL rating uh, and then uh, it, a slow decay of that voltage to 50% over a 50 microsecond period, which is how ANSI simulates a lightning strike. Uh, there are some standard ratings. They're uh, <clears throat> at 15 kV, uh, most manufacturers uh, standardized on 95 kV BIL. I believe that's the, the ANSI standard for that voltage class. And keep in mind that the standards for a dry type transformer versus a liquid filled uh, are different. When we talk about transformers, we have to have several ways of protecting them. One of the ways is fuses. Um, a lot of pad mounted transformers have integral fuses. They, uh, there are a, a few different methods of fusing a transformer. Uh, bayonet fuses have been around for a long time and they uh, are replaceable. From mo most manufacturers put them in the high voltage compartment of the transformer and they can be replaced without going into the tank. So that's a big advantage. Um, there's also an ELSP fuse. It's a, a backup fuse. It's current limiting. And uh, that, while the bayonet fuse is designed to protect the transformer from overloading and heating and such, the <coughs> ELSP fuse is more meant for a short circuit inside of the transformer. Uh, in fact, I believe most manufacturers will uh, tell you that if an ELSP fuse has blown, it's an indication that there's a more severe problem inside the core and coil assembly. Um, at certain KVA ratings, uh, especially if there's a 4160 volt primary, uh, the ampacity becomes too much for a bayonet fuse and even an ELSP fuse. And in that case, we go to a uh, ABB has some high ampacity uh, cartridge fusing systems that uh, they sell to all of the transformer manufacturers. Uh, or we go to some sort of interrupter, um, an MVI or a, uh, or a VFI. These are uh, products that are um, vacuum bottles uh, that are compact. There are many types of bushings in a transformer. You can order live front bushings, which I really, I really do not recommend. <clears throat> there are dead front bushings uh, that are 200 amp, or they come in a 200 amp form factor or a 600 amp. Uh, the 600 amp is a non-load break <clears throat> device. It's a threaded connection, so the transformer must be de-energized. Uh, de uh, in order to pull that uh, device. Uh, on the live front side, uh, we have really seen porcelain almost go away. There are still customers that uh, specify porcelain. Uh, it's getting very, very hard to get porcelain high voltage bushings. Uh, cyclo aliophatic uh, devices are just easier to manufacture. They have uh, superior performance in a lot of different ways. What I've shown here to the right is are some load break elbows. Um, they're made by a lot of different manufacturers, Elastomold, Cooper, 3M, um, and those are the elbows you use to make a dead front connection. Let's see if this video will play. Transformers have losses, and therefore transformers are losers. Okay. So here's a, uh, this is a good time for poll question number three. 
another piece of transformer trivia. We'll see who's paying attention. I'll leave this up for about 30 more seconds. Wow, we've got a shy crowd. Don't be, af don't be afraid to click that mouse button and to help you talk through this and maybe help you answer. DOE 2016 required the efficiencies to go up in transformers. That means the losses had to go down. That means the transformer generates less heat than a transformer manufactured in 2015. Okay, I'm gonna close the poll. Thank you so much for answering. If you answered smaller, you would be correct. There's less heat to remove with a 2016 DOE transformer. Therefore, the corrugate and the radiators can be smaller. The expense goes into the core and coils to make them larger, heavier, and more efficient. There are two types of losses in a transformer. We have to talk about the core losses and winding losses. Uh, I'm going to go, go back to the slide for a second before we get into the actual evaluation. <clears throat> the core losses are what we call no load losses. They're the, the losses that are required to energize the transformer. So they're either on or off. It's not dependent on current or voltage or anything else. When the transformer becomes energized and the core is magnetized, those losses are present, regardless of how much current is going through it. The winding losses are the, sometimes we call the copper losses or uh, aluminum losses if you have aluminum windings. And these are the losses that as current flows through the transformer, the heat um, that's generated by the resistance in the windings is, um, th these are the winding losses. And they are sometimes also called I squared T losses because they are proportional to the uh, square of the current going through the transform. <sighs> Some sophisticated customers uh, end users and many utilities use a formula for evaluating transformer proposals instead of just evaluating them by first cost. So one of the first thing the utility does is they decide what their effective interest rate is and then they decide um, how many years they're going to evaluate this over. So what, we're, what, what they're trying to determine here is the time value of money, okay? Then they're gonna take, they're, they're, they're gonna break up the calculation into three separate uh, calculations. First, they're gonna determine the cost of the, the no load losses or the core losses. They're going to uh, you know, punch this into the calculator that will help them to discount the costs of these core losses back to present value, okay? The next thing they're gonna do is evaluate the winding losses. And they're going to figure out how am I gonna load that transformer? How am I, am I gonna load this transformer to 100% or is it gonna only be loaded to 50%? And we call that the loading factor. And that's gonna help them take the the cost of those losses and discount them back to present value. Then to determine the total owning cost, they are going to, uh, of course, add the no load losses to the load losses to get to their total losses. And at the end, they have a cost of losses and they can add that to their first cost. And now they have a total owning cost of that transformer. There are a variety of different uh, markings or certifications available for transformers. Uh, of course, uh, we should always specify a UL listing. Uh, there's another listing uh, called a UL classification 
for indoor use. And this is a great, uh, well, in fact, it's a must. It's required if you're going to um, put this transformer indoors. There's also an FM uh, label, which is available from uh, one or two manufacturers. And um, it is an adder uh, to put the label on, but it does um, allow that transformer to be used <clears throat> in an indoor application. There are lots of choices nowadays for insulating fluids. Um, there are really just two that are uh, readily available and, and price competitive in the marketplace. There is uh, mineral oil, of course, which has uh, been in existence for uh, 70 or 80 years or more. And uh, then there's the FR3 fluid and its, uh, and its clones. I believe there's a GE markets a product called VG100. Uh, Mydel also has a product uh, that's a natural ester-based <coughs> high fire point fluid. There are other options. Uh, there's uh, alpha fluid and, and uh, a fluid called beta, which I believe is a synthetic ester high fire point fluid. Um, silicone is just not seen that much anymore. We get almost no requests for that. Um, it, it had its place and had its day, but uh, and it is an effective transformer insulating uh, fluid. It has high dielectric strength and a high fire point, but it uh, is very, very expensive to dispose of. Uh, I, I did include a link here to the Dow Corning's website, so you can read about silicone on your on your own time. But it um, we, we we do not see that specified very much anymore at all. So. Um, I've had people ask me, you know, why do we fool with these exotic fluids? You know, why why can't we just use mineral oil? Well, here's the here's the reason. In the 30s and 40s, um, mineral oil was used all over, indoors and outdoors, and uh, our fire protection systems weren't what they are today. Well, when a transformer failed and uh, the upstream circuit breaker would fail to open, which uh, happened on occasion, you not only get a transformer that's on fire, but now you have a, most of the time, the tank ruptured. And now you have a river of oil running down the hallway in a hospital that's on fire. So. It's not, it's, not an I, it's not an ideal situation. So um, inventors and chemists uh, began uh, toying with uh, different ways to insulate a transformer. Um, this is not the first fluid, but it, it's worth uh, noting. Um, they, transformer manufacturers went from, um, they, they tried things like Freon, uh, which was effective, um, but uh, environmentally uh, terrible. Uh, they, um, Westinghouse marketed a product in the 60s called uh, Wecasol, and it uh, was a like a dry cleaning fluid, and uh, again, effective, uh, high fire point, um, good dielectric strength. But uh, again, terrible, terrible for the environment. And these are in a class of fluids we call non-flammable fluids. Um, and then, of course, uh, earlier than that, there were the PCBs, uh, polychlorinated biphenyls, I believe is what that uh, stands for. And uh, again, very effective at what they did. Um, but they were uh, later found out to uh, cause cancer, um, and so they were outlawed um, in 1978. Um, 1978 was the last year that PCBs were manufactured. So there, there are still uh, lots of liquid-filled transformers hanging around uh, in older industrial facilities that contain uh, PCBs. 
SF6 has also been used as a transformer insulating fluid. However, um, it's an expensive uh, chemical and uh, it also has its uh, environmental disadvantages. It, we only see this used in uh, large power transformers like 800 MVA uh, and above. Um, if I was a consultant, I, uh, I thought it would be helpful if I would list um, acceptable manufacturers. Um, and all of these um, are have been around a long time, uh, manufactured both pad mounted and uh, unit substation transformers. And I uh, think they would all do a, a fantastic job. So to get to the point, what are the things that, that you know you, you can do as a consulting engineer to save save money? I I'm a fan of putting the transformer outside. Uh, it, it, this is one man's opinion, but if you're going to use a liquid filled transformer, put it outside. Um, and I would use a pad mounted transformer. And and here's why. No matter which manufacturer you choose, a unit substation transformer is going to be a custom engineered item. There are no catalog numbers for unit substation transformers. Every one of them is engineered to order. Three-phase pad-mounted transformers, because of the volume that they're purchased um, by utilities, uh, there are manufacturers who are used to stamping out sometimes 75, 80, 100 transformers per day of pad mounted units. So for that reason, and that reason only, the dollar per KVA is less when purchasing a pad mounted transformer. It's just a fact of life. And I'm, I'm often asked, is there a difference between the core and coil assembly? in a unit substation transformer versus a pad mounted transformer. There's a conception out there, a misconception that a unit substation transformer core and coil is somehow beefier or somehow more robust. That is absolutely not true. Once a core and coil is designed, once a temperature rating has been provided and a KVA and voltages, those core and coil assemblies are absolutely identical. Some additional reasons to put the pad mounted transformer outside, uh, you reduce your HVAC load. Regardless of how efficient the transformer is going to be, it is going to uh, emit heat and that heat must be removed. Another reason is the transformer. Um, occasionally we see, we hear people complaining about the sound. Uh, this is more dry type than liquid filled uh, really, but um, you, you don't have to, that's something that you kind of take off the table. You don't have to worry about it. Um, the next thing I would do is let the transformer manufacturer decide on the conductor. I would specify uh, transformer shall meet uh, DOE 2016 efficiency requirements and leave it at that. <clears throat> now you're forcing a transformer manufacturer as the contractor goes out for bids to provide the best transformer at the best price, regardless of conductor. Um, and the last thing I would do is I would forget about uh, the FM label. Um, this is still limits, even though it's been in existence for 10 or 15 years, I, I believe there's still only two manufacturers that provide this. So if you are in the world of, um, doing right by your clients and allowing them to get competitive bids, um, limiting competition is probably not uh, the greatest idea. Um, I put some handouts uh, with this presentation. Hey, you can. Hey, Mike. Yes. Um, I'll, I'll add a comment on the FM. Now, one thing you, you can do is you can, all manufacturers can build to the FM standard. Um, you know that FM standard, everyone has a copy of to where they can they can add the additional accessories, the additional pressure relief devices. So to to be able to label a unit with the FM label, there's certain additional accessories that have to be added. So all manufacturers can 
build to the FM label requirements. It's just physically putting that label on the transformer is it is not necessarily required because you can still get the transformer designed with everything and just basically not have the sticker on it. So that's one thing to consider. If you want to open up the field to more than two bidders, you can state that it, it must be designed to the FM global standards, but does not require the actual FM label. <clears throat> That's a great point. And one of the handouts is the FM uh, document <clears throat> that outlines the requirements. It's uh, fairly simple. Um, the transformer needs integral fusing or uh, or fusing upstream. It has to have a cover mounted pressure relief device, um, depending on the KVA size. And uh, I believe it may have to have contacts on the pressure relief device if you get to a certain KBA, and obviously it must be filled with the higher fire point fluid. There are some other handouts uh, you guys can play with. There's some transformer economic calculator um, spreadsheets attached, um, and <clears throat> um, I could spend eight hours here going through all this. What I my goal for today was just to inter introduce you to uh, these different uh, components of a transformer and provide you guys some resources so that you can uh, research it on your own. Um, it's like we're ready for another poll question. Okay, here we go. This one has to do with COVID-19. Michael, we've got a bunch of questions if you want to start addressing them while we're doing these polls. Okay. If 65 degrees C is assumed, what full load amp temperature rise will the percent impedance be measured at? I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. I'm gonna uh, contact my testing folks. That's not something I can answer off the top of my head. It's a great question though. Uh, there's a question, how about weight constraint? Is aluminum a better bet than copper? Aluminum is going to be lighter for sure. Michael, can you hear me? Yes, can you hear me, Adam? Yeah, so um, th this is not an exact answer, but, but typically transformer manufacturers will list that impedance rating on the nameplate and, and most name plates will state that that impedance it was at a 75 degree or an 80 degree C is, is typically what most all manufacturers put on the name plate for that uh, impedance rating that they get during the testing process. Uh, let's see, is there a cost difference between an indoor dry type versus using an outdoor liquid filled pad mount? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I'm gonna say no. Um, occasionally a liquid filled will be more expensive than a uh, standard VPI dry type, um, but not usually, and it's usually within 5%. Yeah, I would agree, Michael. Pad mount versus um, dry type are, are pretty comparable. Now, if you get into a unit substation versus a dry type, typically dry type is is a good bit less. But pad mount, they're they're pretty equal. Uh, this is an interesting question. We're gonna have to get back to you on uh, what horsepower on drives is a standard break point for when a K rating of a transformer should be considered. Um, that is a great question. And uh, that's a, we could spend an entire presentation on that and uh, we will at some point. I'll get back to you with a short answer, but um, we, will, we will spend some time on that in a future webinar. Um, yeah, and also the, um, the K factor typically, it, it might not necessarily be driven by the horsepower of the motor but more or less the harmonic content on the system, you know, whether you're you know, starting that motor across a line or via a soft start or, or a drive. Typically, you know, if, if we can be provided the harmonic spectrum 
um, that you receive from maybe doing a, an ETAP type study or some type of system study where you get from the equipment manufacturers, if we get the harmonic spectrum, we've got the ability to determine what K factor is required. That's correct. <clears throat> All right, I'm gonna close this poll. Um, here's some, uh, Janice Fuller had a great question. Um, she says, uh, consider supplying a UL combination label uh, that holds the manufacturer to the same standard. Um, that will help get the same insurance break on the ins like FM. So uh, I did not know that. Thank you for that, Janice. Uh, I did know that the UL classification uh, label was a duplicate of the FM uh, requirements. Uh, here's a good question. Um, when you do an infinite bus calculation for available fault current at the secondary, which full load amp do you use? And what he's asking is, do we use the base KVA uh, or the fan rating or the 65 degrees C or the 55 degrees C? And I'm gonna go have, I'm gonna have to refresh my memory unless John, you know off the top of your head, uh, I believe it is the base rating uh, but uh, I need to uh, let me get confirm that back to you in writing. Yeah, I agree with you, Michael, because normally you should design your system where you don't need to go into that extra capacity. But if you have a transformer that's overloaded, then I would need to use that current rating. Yeah. Okay. Um, here's a, another question, and this is a uh, this is a good question that I don't have an answer for. How widespread is corrosive sulfur in mineral oil in the US and abroad, and how can we avoid it <clears throat> during the specification process? Uh, I'm gonna have to get back to you on that one. Um, you know, ANSI type two inhibited mineral oil is the um, technical name for the mineral oil that goes into transformers. And we will uh, do some research on that and get back to you. Uh, if you wanna eliminate that, then specify a high fire point fluid and uh, that will um, certainly take care of that. Um, <clears throat> how do you, how much do you derate a transformer based on anticipated harmonics? Uh, this is a, it's a, again, a great question. It's based on K factor. We could spend uh, quite a bit of time on on that, and I will I'll send out some information on that. But uh, you know, transformers are available with a you know a K1 rating all the way to K20. Um, a K20 rating, you know, basically getting you uh, a core and coil that's almost double the size of the unit you would normally need if you only had um, linear loads. <clears throat> Yeah, and it's a uh, it's a broad answer too because if it's a K4, then you know your transformer might have only been derated 10%. If it's a K13, typically we designed it at we designed the transformer at 130, 140%. Um, so you might just say it's a I don't know a, a thousand kVA transformer with a K13 rating. The internals of it's actually going to be designed as a 1,333 kVA transformer at, at standard temperature rating and, and maximum load. Um, but we'll still nameplate at 1,000 kVA K13. So, so it really depends on what that K value is to determine how much D rating factor was applied. Yep. Uh, here's, here's another question. Uh, other than oil gas analysis, what PMs do you recommend for oil filled transformers? Um, that's a great question. Um, you know, inspection of the gauges uh, for sure. Um, and more and more manufacturers are, you know, let's face it, we live in a, a smart world now um, with the Internet of Things, and um, the gauges are more and more getting 
the uh, at least contacts or uh, analog outputs uh, so that a, uh, a a building DCS or a um, some sort of PLC can monitor uh, that transformer um, depending on the size of it um, certainly uh, a differential transformer differential relay uh, could uh, help with that um, what I'm referring to I'm, what I'm trying to say is there are some online monitoring uh, and diagnostic tools that are uh, becoming available that are uh, more cost effective than uh, than in previous generations there it used to be that you wouldn't even think about this kind of thing on a transformer less than 20 or 40 or 60 mva but uh, now we see people putting some of these devices on 2500 kva transformers uh, because the cost has come down so much so yeah, you've got um like like for example with the with the GE multi-lamp rep. So we've got like an online diagnostic and monitoring equipment that can go on liquid fields to I mean it looks at you know 10 or 12 different gases in the transformer and depending on the gas we know what event might have occurred at the transformer and give you live feedback. But if you've just got a simple transformer already installed in the field, taking taking the oil sample annually is definitely recommended. Um, the other two simple tests is just doing a TTR, turn ratio test, and a mega test on the transformer. Usually that will give you enough of a thumbprint to know if there's any issues with the transformer. And a fairly simple test that, that a lot of the service outfit can perform and perform pretty quickly. Yeah, that is correct. Um, <clears throat> Let's see here. Um, what factors determine the impedance of a transformer? Oh boy, this um, th there's a lot of different factors. Um, the gosh, the the conductor, the way the transformer is wound. Um, there there are just several different. Um, it's it's too much to go into right now, but I do have a document on that that I'll send out uh, to you. Um, I have a question. There's a question here from Robert Palmer, and um, uh, the the musician from the '80s. And um, you know, I, I loved your your stuff, so thank you. Um, <clears throat> what do you do if you determine your oil filled transformer is no longer sealed to the outside environment? Is there an immediate concern? Uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. There is an immediate concern. Uh, mineral oil and especially FR3 um will absorb moisture out of the outside air unfortunately um transformer liquid fill transformers are meant to be a sealed design uh, they are not meant to exchange air with the outside world and eventually what's going to happen is enough moisture content will enter your fluid from the outside air and the dielectric strength of the fluid will break down it will become much less than what it's specified to be and you will have a uh, winding failure you'll have a face-to-face uh, -face fall <clears throat> uh, michael is that the reason they put a nitrogen blanket on a lot of transformers yes yep uh, let's see for larger transformers what is the economics versus functionality between a delta Y and a YY grounding transformer? Um, well, I can tell you that a delta Y transformer is always going to be less money than a YY transformer. Always, always. Um, because if you have a YY transformer, you're going to have to use a uh, five legged core. Uh, for the uh, currents to circulate the ground currents and uh, that's that's always more expensive so um, this is a good question for substation liquid fill transformers uh, sealed and non-sealed type are nitrogen blankets required uh, it is some manufacturers standard to put a nitrogen blanket uh, on top of the fluid before sealing the tank. 
but not all of them. So if this is something that you want, it must be specified in the specification because it's not part of um, an ANSI standard for distribution transformers. Um, Mike, did you want to do your other poll for answering these questions? Uh, yes. While he's doing that, um, one bit of trivia for those that are not utility customers. I get asked a lot, why would I specify Y, Y versus a Y delta or a delta Y? The delta Y, you're going to get a phase shift. And the reason you, the reason utilities use a Y, Y is they can change all these different voltage levels and not have to worry about a phase shift in the transformers. So that's one of the big differences. While you guys are filling out that poll, and I appreciate the responses, <clears throat> we're going to talk about what, in the current events, what what's happening. So, an executive order was signed last week um, that um, is protects the United States from uh, purchasing any additional electrical equipment for what. Uh, our president has defined as the bulk power system, which uh, to me is the, the grid, uh, if you will, and, and utilities. Um, he is uh, attempting to secure, to secure our power grid. And um, so there are gonna be tariffs on certain materials uh, from countries that the United States is not friendly with. And, um, I'm going to offer no political you know, opinion on this. I'm just trying to report uh, the facts. It's unclear uh, as of yet. Uh, there are a few different interpretations of the executive order. Uh, I have put a summary, a link to a summary here from the National Law Review. And you can read uh, that and, and form an opinion uh, from yourself. But this will affect um, Transformer manufacturers, um, you know, in, in China, uh, potentially Korea. Um, I don't, you know, it's unknown whether this will affect uh, Mexico or not. And uh, part of what has stimulated this is uh, AK Steel, who is a manufacturer of uh, silicon steel, which is the silicon used in transformer and magnetic cores, is closing. A few of their facilities because they um, they can't they can't get business they they can't compete with um, the core steel manufacturers abroad um, and I I I don't I don't know if the transform manufacturers um, that I'm familiar with if they're using core steel from China I know that there's plenty of Japanese core steel being used by a, a multitude of manufacturers um, but. Um, I think this is going to change things um, in the next six to 12 months, and I believe it, it's it's my belief anyway that the price of transformers will be affected by this. Okay, now I'm going to leave the. Okay, so if you want more information on protecting a transformer, we've devoted an entire webinar to transformer dis differential protection, which, like I said, has become uh, and and is becoming more and more affordable, and so that it can be considered on distribution type transformers. And that's on May 28th. And uh, when you get this presentation, there, there's a link to, to register uh, for that webinar. And, and now I'm gonna leave the room so you guys can um, tell John and everybody what you thought of the presentation. Here's one more question. Um, find interesting how many transformer manufacturers are left in the US um, these are I'm, I'm gonna limit this to liquid filled when I answer um, there is um, there are several um, 
you know, we are uh, lucky. That, hey, Michael. Uh, hey, Michael. Yes. Let's um, let's se separate your answer. So power transformers would be uh, one particular answer, then distribution transformers would be another. Um, and I'll be glad to help you with this answer if you'd like. Okay. All right. Yeah. Feel free to correct me. I'm gonna try try to do it off the top of my head. Um, distribution transformers in the U.S. Uh, you know, we've got Howard in Mississippi. Uh, Cooper is in uh, Wisconsin. There are two separate plants there for uh, pad mounted and then unit substation type transformers. ABB has a transformer has a manufacturing facility in um, Jefferson City and uh, South Boston, where South Boston does the small and medium power and Jeff City does pad mounted distribution transformers. Uh, there's MGM on the West Coast that also does liquid fill distribution style. Um, I, believe Central, I believe Central Maloney is still in existence. Uh, there's Virginia Transformer in Roanoke, Virginia. Uh, RTE Uptograph, I believe, is still in, ex in existence. Uh, what am I missing? Okay, Adam, Van go Tran. ahead. Yeah, Vantran in Waco, Texas. Um, I believe that is it for new manufacturers capable of you know, semi-mass production. Yeah, that would be right for um, for you know, unit substation type medium power and um, distribution small power units, say you know 15 MBA and below. Then from a power transformer standpoint, um, you've got Virginia Transformer has two plants in the U.S. He has plant in the U.S. Um, Delta Star has plants in the U.S. And um, SPX, Waukesha, and Plant, and Niagara, and Howard. So uh, that would be on the on the power transformer side of things that are in the U.S. And Virginia down in Rincon. Yeah, yeah, that's what I said. Yeah, Virginia's got the two facilities in the U.S. as well. So we're, uh, we're way over our allotted one hour but thank you all so much for uh, attending and um, if there's questions that I see a few questions here that we just don't have time to answer and I'll be getting back to you individually uh, via email to answer uh, some of these questions so uh, thank you very much and uh, we're very grateful for your attention